our way to Moscow, the capital of the largest country in the world. And what a country. Russia is so tremendous in size that it covers one-seventh of the entire inhabited area of the world. It spreads over two continents, and more than 150 languages and dialects are spoken within its boundaries. In the north, men live in a land of snow and ice. In the south, palm trees flourish. Often one Russian needs an interpreter to speak to another. Now, during this trip, we shall cover 10,000 miles of the interior. Places seldom pictured, places changing so rapidly, it's a task to keep up with them. Ah, but you better get your things together now, for we're about to visit Russia's Washington, its capital, Moscow. You'll always find these Moscow railway stations busy, for it is the logical starting point for any trip through or any study of Russia. Mr. Charles E. Stewart, internationally known industrial engineer, whose services were engaged by the Russian government in their effort to Americanize the methods of developing natural resources, spent parts of more than five consecutive years in Russia and made these pictures possible. But here we are at the Hotel Metropole. Political delegates from all over the states of the Union uh, make a constant flow of inhabitants that come to this hotel. For Russia has aroused the interest of the world. Meet Mr. Stewart. He's conferring with an important government official. And of course, an interpreter is necessary as many details must be cared for in planning such an extensive trip, especially as we're going to take moving pictures as we go. In Moscow are preserved many interesting relics covering all the stages of its growth through eight long centuries. Fires have ravished it. Invaders from the Tatars to Napoleon have devastated it. Governments have come and gone. But Moscow, just like Old Man River, keeps rolling along. It is true that there have been difficult times for the Russian people during the development of their great and bold experiment. But look at Russia today. In Moscow, there are wide streets lined with shops that offer to the Moscovite and the tourist alike an ever-increasing assortment of life's necessities. Let's go window shopping. Now, we have heard much of the poverty and ignorance of the Russian peasants and workers. Ah, but don't believe all you hear. For Russia, under their new regime, is going places and doing things. The people may not always be found laughing and joking, but you'll notice a look of earnestness about them. They have taken a tremendous task upon themselves, and they're endeavoring to see it through. Moscow is not unlike any city of the old world. Crowds pour through its railway stations, both steam and electric. It has its taxis, its trolleys, its carts, its automobiles, its crowded streets, its stores, and even a subway system. Yes, Moscow has much that is new, but everywhere it speaks of age. The weather-beaten walls of the Kremlin, the battlemented monasteries, and the many quaint domes of the ancient churches that we'll see that dot the city.
we have only to look into the faces and watch the clothing of these people as they pass to realize the great leveling influence the new Soviet government has already exerted. You will find these same people tilling the soil, occupying judicial benches, developing industry and representing their various states. The Russian peasant is an important factor in national life. He is fitting himself for his ever new responsibilities. The development of railways, the building of industries in the towns where he goes to work, and the establishment of more schools, all are a part of his endeavors. The native Russian is naturally home-loving, not aggressive, and he has ever been so. Their folklore, their legends, and their poetry always speak of a profound love of peace and home. Throughout the parks and public squares, beautifully cultured statues and monuments and fountains speak of the fact that Russia has given the world great men in every branch of human thought. The names of Pushkin, Gorky, and Tolstoy are immortal. And in music, Glinka, Tchaikovsky, Rimsky-Korsakov, and Rachmaninoff will live forever. And speaking of the music and the arts, this great square is the heart of the theatrical district. The Grand Theater, the Little Theater, the Children's Theater, and the celebrated Moscow Art Theater are here. The um, Art Theater gave the world so many great plays and players. There is also the old Imperial Theater of Moscow, where in pre-revolution days, operas were sung amid rich scenes of splendor. It has remained a sanctuary of art and beauty under the Soviet government but now booted peasants occupy royal boxes. Excellent productions are still staged. And here, because of its great size, sessions of the All-Russian Congress of the Soviets are held. Nearby is the House of the Unions. The visitor, as he walks through the street, constantly passes buildings in which political and social conferences are held. Russia has been called the baby giant among the nations. This is the Palace of Labor. And here, from the famous old iron bridge, one of the seven that span the Moscow River, we look into the Kremlin. Russia's historic center and sacred shrine. This ancient fortress-like triangle is girded by a battlement of brick wall a mile and a quarter in length and 65 feet high. The original wall on this side was built before Columbus discovered America. 19 towers stud the wall and five great gates afford access to a conglomerate mass of buildings which constitute a great nation's treasure house. In no other equal area in the world is there crowded such an array of cathedrals, monasteries, sacred relics, and trophies of war. The Kremlin is to Russia what the Roman Forum and St. Peter's combined are to Italy. Here we are inside the walls. This is the Cathedral of Assumption, built in 1475 and the scene of the spectacular coronation of the Tsars. And here in the Cathedral of Archangels, built in 1505, all the Tsars up to Peter the Great were buried. Now most of these rulers left some relic behind them. In the case of Tsarina Anna, it was a great bell, the largest ever cast, weighing 200 tons. This is the famous Tsar cannon weighing 38 and a half tons. A man can crawl into its 17 and a half foot barrel. Lying to the east of the Kremlin is the spacious Red Square. Much of the drama of Russia's grandeur and tragedy has unfolded in this beautiful open space. In the olden days, it was the scene of public executions, hangings and flogging. Often it rang with the music of martial parades and imperial proclamations. Terror of the last revolution reached its heights in Red Square. Today it is peaceful. Peddlers and artists sell their wares to tourists.
a double line of visitors is always waiting to enter the mausoleum of Lenin that stands right beside the Kremlin wall. For here, his body lies in a glass coffin. His followers from all over the world come to pay tribute to their leader. Behind this mausoleum at the base of the Kremlin wall are the graves of many other leaders in the cause of the people, among them four Americans. The story of centuries is vividly told in the brick and stone of the Kremlin. One of the many orphanages of Russia awakens to activity. Here we find what were yesterday's waifs. These children were once bands of wild roving boys and girls who left alone by the war and the revolution had to fight for their very bread. Today, Russia demands that the coming generation shall be cared for. Many of the great estates, once owned by the wealthy class, are now educational centers. This orphanage, for example, occupies the famous estate of Maxim Gorky, where Lenin lived and died. Here, the children receive wholesome food, healthful recreation, and they are schooled in all the trades and professions. They are taught how to till the soil, for agriculture will always be of primary importance in Russia. They do their own building. These boys are preparing themselves to extend Russia's modern conveniences of telephone and telegraph over their vast domain. Individual training is given in all branches of mechanics. These wild boys of a few years ago have accepted the change and many of them have thrilled to the power of accomplishment. While a lot of the old traits are still strong, Kindly and patient instruction, day after day, is doing its work. It's surprising how these Russian children, once living like wild animals, have adapted themselves to the routine of classes, and how these classes are Americanized to the extent of the translation of many of our works into Russian. English is studied as their chief foreign language. The instruction is good and the teachers patient and the students receptive. It has been said by a rather huge visitor that every Russian carries a book in one hand and a hoe in the other. Certainly the children are taking both seriously. A little later, we shall show you the famous symphony orchestra without a leader. Here we... But we leave the children of Russia in the care of their guardians while we make our way to the magnificent stadium of the Dynamo Sports Club. In the distance, you see what is known as the Triumphant Gates monument built by Alexander I, commemorating Russia's victory over Napoleon in 1812. Russia retains the influence exerted upon it by many nations. There isn't a great deal of difference between this picture of sport fans gaining their way into Russia's greatest sports arena and any crowd outside of our own Yankee Stadium.
But in this case, it's a game of soccer, a British game, equivalent to our game of football. But in soccer, the player may use his feet, knees, head, everything except his hands. And what a game they play. And what a thrill it is to see gathered together 75,000 excited Russians at one time, a sight and sound never to be forgotten. We look again upon the busy side of life in Russia. Russia is so large that the people vary a great deal. Many different languages are spoken and the costumes vary from the picturesque high-headed Tatar to the famous blouse and boots. And so when representatives from the various republics meet to buy, sell, or barter their products, we see a colorful scene. This is the commodity market located right in the heart of Moscow. As we take you around, observe the different types of people and the great variants of merchandise. One of the greatest steps forward that the new Russia has taken is the improvement and increase of manufacture. More and more factories are being built and modern machinery installed. It has been found that Russia prefers American-made machinery because of its stability and its almost foolproof operation. When Poland was a part of Russia, most of their manufactured products came from there. But Russia's plan to operate so that they will not have to rely on other countries means that they must lay great stress on increased manufacture. To this end, every factory is obliged to take in a percentage of apprentices who learn the trades while young and are given a small wage. In these factories, we find a great many women workers. For you see, when women were given equal rights in Russia, they were also given equal work. This necessitates the maintaining of large nurseries at each plant, operated by trained nurses and doctors where the laborers' children are cared for during the working hours. They are given every attention. They receive their early schooling. They even get their shower baths every day and have lots of fun. Nighttime in Moscow. This is known as Theater Square and is a very beautiful spectacle. When I tell you that there are over 50 theaters in Moscow, it shows that they like to entertain and to be entertained. One of the favorite pastimes in the matter of dancing is for a group on the stage to see which one can outdo the others. And although their dance is very energetic, the winner may have to dance for hours, and while he works, the audience eats.
This is the dance of the nations, and Uncle Sam is always represented. Nowhere else in the world can you find such a huge, enthusiastic, and receptive audience as you find in Moscow. Another kind of entertainment is found in the clubhouses for workers, and these are very, very popular. When the day's tasks are over, they like to go to their favorite clubhouse and meet their friends. Perhaps I should have said opponents. Chess is a great game in Russia, and they have produced many champions. In the clubhouses, there is dining and dancing too. It's a place to spend a pleasant evening. Russians have always been known for their love of music. Every city has its symphony orchestra and gives many concerts. Each man knows his music well and plays it as he feels it. There is no leader. You'll notice that the eye of the musician is always on his music. Everyone has heard of Tolstoy great Russian author. This is his home. It is now a museum and is preserved exactly as it was when Tolstoy lived in it. It's a two-story house standing in the heart of a large tree-shaded park. In this room, Tolstoy's study, stands one of the earliest of Edison's dictaphones. You see, Thomas Edison was a great admirer of Tolstoy's works, and he gave it to him when he found that Tolstoy was very nearsighted and had difficulty in writing. In the peaceful grounds with their birch trees and quiet waters, Tolstoy gained many of his inspirations. We leave Moscow now to travel about 350 miles south to one of the fastest growing cities of the world, Kharkov. Although Kharkov was founded early in the 17th century, it is comparatively speaking a new city. It has a population of over half a million and is the largest city of the Ukraine. Because of its advantageous position and a network of railroads that connect it with all the principal cities of Russia, Kharkov has become the industrial, commercial, and scientific center of the Union. Libraries, museums, and theaters abound, and a stadium to accommodate 100,000 people is now under construction. Here is the largest university in all Russia. Kharkov is also the educational center. Here we find students of higher learning that come from all over the world. Kharkov University was founded in 1805, 130 years ago. Today the city is in a fervor of new construction and the modern trend that it is taking is strikingly shown in these new apartment houses built largely of glass and steel. Here is a group of engineers inspecting the largest electrical factory in Russia. Great thought is being given to the tremendous natural resources that are in Russia. One of the largest hydroelectric stations in the world has been completed by American engineers, and others are under construction. Electricity is becoming a great factor. Now we're on our way to Nizhny Novgorod. The name of the city has recently been changed to Gorky. But Novgorod or Gorky is really the Detroit of Russia. Because of the many workers employed in the industrial center here, there are spacious playgrounds to make the children happy. 
For centuries, Gawky has been known for its famous fairs. They were fairs with all the trimmings. The Barkers were even more colorful when they told of their sideshow attractions in emphatic Russian. merry-go-rounds were even more interesting when you listened to old Russian folk songs and you rode on imitations of Arabian steeds and saw glittering decorations everywhere. And there were lots of whatever the children wanted, swings, thrilling rides, and roller coasters. And you can always get ice cream and soda pop, even pink lemonade. Yes, there is a happy side to the Russian people. They spend their time off just about as we do. Gorky is well called the Detroit of Russia, for they work as hard as they play. Huge deposits of coal and iron are put to good use. Iron and steel from here are shipped to the farthest most parts of the vast domain to aid in the various industries. Huge and powerful locomotives are built to bring close together cities that are really hundreds of miles apart. Mills here supply 90% of all the paper used in Russia, and construction is going on at an ever-increasing speed. Gorky, situated as it is at the junction of the Oka and Volga rivers, has been an important trading center since the 11th century. Residents of Gorky, like all Russians, want always to learn more of this new mode of living. And so wherever you go, you are very apt to see a group of interested spectators listening to someone explaining Russia's new doctrines. Gorky interests every traveler, its parks and slopes and terraces, its picturesque streets, its people, its old customs and ancient architecture, all combine to make you wonder at the romance of this old city built 700 years ago. Now that children have been Russia's greatest problem ever since the many wars of the revolution. But the new Russia has sincerely tackled the problem. Everything possible is done to care for the children's needs in work time and in playtime. You have heard perhaps much about Russian divorce law. Now getting a divorce unless both parties agree is not as simple as we are led to believe. If either party is ill or out of work, the other must pay alimony. If there are children such as these, their guardianship and support must be provided for. In Russia, every fifth day is called a rest day. Their days are numbered, not named like ours. 
The Russian knows the number of the day of the month, but not without stopping to think carefully does he know the day of the week. And on rest days, only such important services as telephone and telegraph and railroads and streetcars continue operation. Everyone else plays. Here we see one of the cultural athletic centers, and there are thousands of children at play and many parents joining in the fun. Our first view of the romantic Volga River, made famous through song and story, is gained from a high plateau, the Kremlin Gardens. Here at the junction of the two important waterways, we see the immensity of the longest river in Europe. It follows a winding course for 2,300 miles through some of the most picturesque parts of the Union, emptying its waters at last into the Caspian Sea. We shall see on our way to Kazan, a two-day trip by river boat, a score of interesting peoples, quaint villages and great monasteries creating an ever-changing skyline. The age-old Makaryev Monastery appears in the distance as a forest of gleaming minarets and gilded towers. The city of Kazan is the capital of the Tatar Republic, and it was founded in 1483 by the Tatars, just nine years before the discovering of America. And against it, Muscovy waged a stubborn struggle until the troops of Ivan the Terrible captured the city in 1552. It is still a cultural and industrial center. Perhaps the most interesting landmark of Kazan is the ancient Tatar tower of Sumbeka. It was partially destroyed in the siege of the city, but was rebuilt in the 17th century by the Russians. In the University of Kazan, such outstanding personalities as Tolstoy and Lenin were educated. Again, we board the large roomy steamer and enjoy the excellent cuisine of the Volga River boats. Again, we watch the ever-changing riverbanks. On our way to Stalingrad, our next port of call. In the evening when the shadows lengthen and the scenic splendor is beyond compare, the sun sets on a busy day as we think of the many interesting sights still in store for us in this huge land of Russia.
we're up with the sun. And our shipmates at an early breakfast recount the many old legends that surround the name of Stefan Razin. He was known as the Russian Robin Hood. They tell of the folk songs and the native ballads that celebrate Razin and his heroic band. They point in the direction of the rugged Ziguli Mountains, the headquarters of the band. But all we see now are marks of the new industry. Huge stone quarries meet our eyes. And here is a peculiar phase of Russian life. It is known as the German Soviet Republic. For almost a hundred miles, the Volga River flows by innumerable villages populated by the descendants of German colonists. Back in the days of Catherine the Great, these lands, then mere prairies, were given as grants to relatives and friends in Germany. But with them came this proviso, that they could live on or leave the lands, but they could never sell. As a result of that gift, today there is a population of over 400,000 in this region. The German of Berlin is spoken and taught in the schools. The newspapers are published in German and typical German architecture is often seen. We approach Stalingrad where we shall leave the romantic Volga for it here turns southeast and flows through level plains into the Caspian Sea. Now Stalingrad is of course named after Stalin in recognition of the prominent part he played in the civil war and in the defense of the city. It is largely industrial and perhaps best known for the huge tractor plant created with the help of American workers and engineers. This plant is the largest in the world and has really modernized methods used in Russian collective farms. But industries, although of great importance here, are not the only points of interest. Stalingrad is extremely old. And here, more than in any other city, you will find the contrast of ancient landmarks with modern schools and theaters. In this section of Russia, and during the remainder of our trip, we shall see many types of Russians. For here, we are north of both the Caspian and the Black Seas. The Near East, with its Armenians and Georgians and Caucasians, is close at hand. And a little farther south, there is colorful Persia, Turkey, and Greece. And all these different races have had their influence on the population of southern Russia. The Volga flows through wooded country and serves to carry the huge timbers from the great forests to the mills. Stalingrad has approximately the same climate as we have, and Russians, like ourselves, look to the beaches for rest and relaxation. In cities that have waterfronts, rest day will always find throngs headed for the beaches. all ready for a day's outing. So many people and such small boats, <laughs> it sort of makes this resemble a scene on the Hoboken Ferry. Why, they even use trailers. In this section, the beaches look strange to an American. Or in hands, we find shores of cobblestones, but the stones are round and smooth and warmed by the sun. And these children are just as much at home as we would be at our own. In Russia, bathing suits are optional. Like everything else, it depends on the individual. They have no false modesty. It's just a matter of getting as much fun as possible while the sun shines. 
There's an art to real relaxation. And so we see that in Stalingrad, the life of the people is divided between the seriousness of industry and the necessity for recreation. As we go south from Stalingrad, we shall see the real meaning of what is known as collective farming. And it is of great interest to watch the shifting scenes from the train window as we enter the North Caucasian steppes, alive with giant Soviet farms. Mile after mile after mile of grain fields stretch before us. And all this is one great farm, worked by the citizens of a nearby village. This is a typical Caucasian village. The old houses with their thatched roofs, more modern dwellings. From this center, the workers go to the far corners of their gigantic farm to tend the crops. At a way station, our train stops. The natives eagerly await the arrival of every train, for the hungry and thirsty passengers are glad to buy their apples, their peaches, and hard-boiled eggs served with salt and chicken sandwiches, water that has been boiled, and of course, the ever-present caviar. But on again through fields that before the new plan was put into effect were virgin soil. Now the largest grain ranches in the world are here. Of these, the largest is called Gigant. It covers over 500,000 acres. This method of farming was introduced in 1921 by American workers from our own west coast who settled in the northern Caucasus. They established the Seattle Commune, which neighbors the Gigant and it is named after our own Seattle. Like a mighty wall, the Caucasian mountains stretch across this strip of land that forms a bridge between Europe and Asia. Seven mountain peaks in this range are higher than the Alps. From the Valley of Nazan, noted for its curative waters, we get a spectacular view of Mount Elbrus, which towers 18,000 feet into the sky. Here we find many beautiful old palaces and estates that have been converted into rest resorts and to which the people come from all parts of Russia for the cure. You see, Narzan is to Russia what Baden-Baden is to Germany or Hot Springs is to America. And the waters are reported to be especially good for people suffering from diseases of the heart. The whole town takes on the aspect of a resort. But there has been a great change in the type of visitor to be seen here at Narzan in recent years. For over 50 years, only the upper classes of wealth and position used these healing waters to benefit them. But now, now they are given freely to the masses. And this is only one of the many advantages given to the people by the new government.
Throughout this whole section of Russia and the Caucasian mountains, we see the marvels of nature, the same geological epoch that caused the great volcanic cone of Mount Elbrus made clefts in the heart of the earth, which are still the supply of the rejuvenating waters that made this section famous. The landscape is dotted with rest homes, clinics, and libraries. Adults and children alike may make good use of all of nature's gifts. All sorts of recreations are supplied. Russia realizes the importance of good health, especially in its children. And those that need it most are sent here. The use of the waters together with the Caucasian sun, the woods, the spaciousness of the plateau, and the luxuriant vegetation make this the place where all the curative powers of nature may be used to an unlimited extent. The populace is very cosmopolitan. These smiling, healthy children uh, that are getting their daily sun bath may be the children of Georgians, Persians, Armenians, or Turks. But whatever their parentage, they are happy, healthy, and vigorous. While most of the people in these communities are transient, spending here the two weeks vacation a lot of them each year, there are some very interesting tribes of natives higher up in the mountains. Their methods and customs and clothing are still what they were hundreds of years ago. They are slow to change. Their dance is as simple as their mode of life, but it's very important to them. All Russians love to dance. We shall carry with us many memories of the great Mount Elbrus as we make our way to other interesting places in southern Russia. We drive through the mountain passes over the Georgian military highway, through the heart of the ranges. It's a long series of ups and downs, for right before us, we see the next great peak, Mount Kazbek. As we travel along, we see more of the American influence in the modern machinery used in repairing the roads. Oh, it's a long, hard pull for the farmer in these parts to get his produce to market. There are many beautiful mountain passes and gorges. There are places where these mighty walls drop straight down for 6,000 feet. Gigantic granite slopes form what is known as the Daryal Pass, a tremendous gash in the heart of the earth spanned by Devil's Bridge. There is beauty and grandeur in the scenery that is awe-inspiring, but also one is reminded of their great age by the cold barrenness of their slopes. It is here that the climate changes from summer to winter within a mile.
Again, as we climb from an altitude of 7,800 feet, the rivers below look like tiny silver threads. Here we are in the land of the Georgians, in the very mountain spoken of in the famous old Greek legend. According to this legend, Prometheus was the founder of civilization, for he stole fire from the heavens to enlighten the world. And as punishment, he was chained to one of these crags of these mountains. And the Georgians are a very interesting people. They themselves claim to be descendants of Togarma, the great grandson of Noah. They were among the earliest Christians, having accepted the faith about the year 330, over 1,600 years ago. Wherever travelers make a stopover, you are apt to find a bit of entertainment. This time, it's a trained Russian bear that has the center of the state. And the natives are jolly and glad to aid us in every way. Now, this bear is a bit hungry, too. But his trainer will make him climb the pole before he gets what's on the end of that stick. And without question of doubt, when the bear has finished looking for food, the trainer starts looking for rubles. Now, after a short but rough walk along the mountainside, we come upon Kazbekian, the watering place. The building is old and built of jagged stones, but once inside, we feel the warm friendship of a kind and strangely witty people, quite in contrast to some of the northern Russians. They drink to our health and we drink to theirs, but neither knows what the other says. Outside of the inn, after lunch, we rest for a while and learn more about these people. The mighty arm of the law is hardly long enough to be very effective up here, but the natives are all well behaved, and if one should leave the straight and narrow path, the others see to it that he is either shamed or punished. Now, it may be the altitude, or it may be their rugged existence, but here the old saying is true, the first hundred years are the hardest. Many men live well over a hundred years, and some of their languages have never been printed. But again, we must be on our way. It's been a pleasant stopover with smiles and songs and dances, and they are just as sorry to see us go as we are to leave. But it's a long, winding road to Tiflis, and so we say goodbye to all our friends. On our way to Gudar Pass, we are reminded that soon we shall leave these great heights and we shall look again now upon the proud snow-capped peaks about us. We drink in the beauty of the old forts and monasteries that are silhouetted against the sky. These mountains formed the logical barrier between Europe and Asia in olden days, when the now crumbling walls of their forts were useful. We are about to enter what was a part of the capital of old Georgia and the cradle of their culture. For the Georgians, it has the deepest significance. And there are still remains a group of extremely interesting buildings. One temple contains the tombs of the Georgian kings of the fifth and sixth centuries. But today, all that is left of this once glorious city are a few buildings used by the nuns as a cloister of study and for a home. But they welcome the passerby and freely offer him their limited hospitality. Mitchell is claimed by its citizens to have been founded by one of Noah's sons who strolled over from Mount Ararat one day after the water subsided and chose this site because of its extreme height. And as we again get into our automobiles and continue our journey, we look back at the forbidding walls and their plain parapets, and we dream of the 14 centuries of history that they have been looking down upon.
On our way to Tiflis, we traversed the magnificent Georgian military highway. It was under construction for more than half a century and was completed in 1864. It is unequaled for its spectacular beauty as it winds its way into the valley. Now we approach the new Zemo Akhalian hydroelectric power station, located where the Aragva and the Yulkura River meet. The Great Cement Dam rises the water level over 75 feet, forming a huge reservoir from which the water runs through channels to the turbines and drives the machinery of a huge plant that supplies Tiflis and all surrounding territories with light and power. From an altitude of 2,400 feet on Mount David, we shall have a splendid view of the capital of Georgia. Tiflis, the metropolis of the Eurasian borderland, is noted for its hot sulfur springs. As a matter of fact, the word Tiflis is derived from the ancient Georgian word Tiflisi, which means warm springs. Like most Near Eastern cities, Tiflis is divided into two parts, the ancient and the modern. The people form cosmopolitan crowds. Georgians, Persians, Jews, Armenians, Turks, and Tatars, and the mountain tribesmen, all giving the impression of the bold, free life of old Georgia. We find several floating water wheels. Because of the tremendous rise of the water level caused by the spring melting of the mountain snows, the whole power plant is allowed to go up and down with the water while the current turns the wheels. Here, flour is made in the very old-fashioned way. Side by side with the ancient buildings, we find surprisingly modern structures. In the new Tiflis, there are straight, wide boulevards, graceful public buildings, theaters, museums, and huge industrial plants. Here, under the new regime, we find unceasing activity. The street scene in Tiflis is an ever-changing panorama. Every mode of transportation is used, from the water buffaloes and the donkeys to the modern streetcars and automobiles. The marketplace is indeed colorful. Here over 80 languages are spoken, and the vendors offer the rugs of Persia, the laces of Armenia, and the hammered brass handicraft of the Orient. Directly above Tiflis rises Mount David. Here is located the famous pleasure resort, which we reach by means of a cable car that carries us up over 2,000 feet. Here is the cable car. In this resort, we see Russia really at play. Men, women, and children join in the fun. Here, just as in all the rest of Russia, the dance is a favorite form of amusement. And what a contrast between the graceful dance of this little lady and the dance we watched performed by the mountaineers. In this section, the music is very meaningful. The history of the Near East is written in their folklore and in their song.
Here on the mountainside, family gatherings are to be found everywhere enjoying themselves under blue halcyon skies. And at sunset, when the lights of the far-flung town gleam through the blue dusk, from that vantage point, there is a view that once seen lingers long in the memory. But we leave the people of Tiflis at play as we make our way to Baku, the city of oil, located on the western shore of the Caspian Sea. It is the largest port of the Caspian. Baku is a city of contrast. Like Tiflis, it consists of the old city and the new. The modern Baku has grown at a startling speed. But the old remains the same. It has crooked, winding, cobblestone streets, dingy, flat-roofed houses with jutting balconies, turban street vendors in colorful costumes, and little shops redolent with the perfume of the East. The new Baku owes its rapid growth to the development of the oil fields. Here we find a veritable forest of oil wells. When American methods were introduced, Baku became the third largest oil field in the world. Already there are 2,000 wells in operation, and the drilling of others goes on at an ever-increasing speed. Oil is pumped through pipelines from Baku completely across the Transcaucasia to Batum on the Black Sea a distance of over 600 miles. The road to Batum leads us through the town of Kutayas, and here again we find characters of the countryside on their way to market, carrying their strange wares. The market brings together the many types that make up this borderland country. On the other side of this huge range of mountains, we find an entirely different country. In the Western Caucasus, we find the largest of the great community farms. These huge enterprises are made possible through the use of modern American equipment. Tractors pulling multiple plows and discs and harrows make the soil ready for planting. When the women in Russia were emancipated, they took upon themselves a responsibility. You will find them shoulder to shoulder with the men, developing the new Russia. Acre after acre is cultivated. Men handle the modern machinery and women do their share in the field. Your wheat is cut and threshed right in the field where it grows. The bags of grain are then carted to the civic center, and from there, shipped to all parts of the world. Lunchtime finds the small groups hungry and thirsty. Although they have worked hard, they are replenished with wholesome food, after which the native stories and songs give them new energy to complete the day. Often we see entire families on the road. Mama drives, Papa pushes, and the children have a hayride. The countryside is alive with interesting sights. The people, their homes, and their livestock. But of all the colorful characters in Georgia, perhaps the best known and most talked of is the self-appointed guardian of the ruins of the temple of Baghdad. Here is a man who has come down with the ages. 
Like the temple itself, he stands for the traditions of old Georgia. These ruins date from the 11th century. This fortress and temple of Bagrat was built in 1002 by the Georgian Christians. It was destroyed by the Turks when the old man was cloistered here studying for the priesthood. He has made it his life's work to bring the story of the temple to every passerby. For to him, even though it be in ruins, this temple is still alive with memories. Tires, we travel about a hundred miles to Tvilbuli, an important industrial town of Georgia. Although many commodities are produced here, coal mining and the quarrying of limestone form the most important. These mountains have always held huge deposits of valuable coal, but until this new plan was put into effect, and American engineers brought here by the Soviet government, very inefficient methods were used and very little coal produced. Now they follow rich coal veins deep into the mountain's depths. There is a veritable network of tracks that have been laid just to transport the coal from the deep mines to the modern crushers, washers, and sorters. When you consider the vast increase in production of these methods over the old, it is easy to realize what an improvement has been made. Workers used to hack at the mountainsides with picks and shovels, using manpower instead of machinery. In the place of powered equipment, they used the mountain streams to turn the wheels and to carry, screen, and wash the coal. What a change in scenery there is as we leave the jagged mountain peaks that hold only a life of toil for their people and the lovely corner of the coastline of the Black Sea where we now travel. Gagri in the lowlands is coastly embraced by the mountains and sheltered by them. Only the south and southwest winds can reach this rolling country, giving it the warmest climate on the whole seacoast. When we see on every hand such beautiful landscape pictures dotted with poplars and pines and palms and with huge, knotty, twisted trees almost as old as the mountains themselves, it is easy to believe in the old legend that the natives love to tell, the legend that places the Garden of Eden not in the valley of Mesopotamia, but here, here in the Caucasus, on the shores of the Black Sea. On our way to Batum, as we pass through Sufum, where there are many sanatoriums and health resorts and government reserves. You see, throughout all its changes, Russia has held to a constant study in the matter of scientific experimentation. The climate of this section is so suitable for research that here we find a magnificent botanical garden where study puts agriculture on a scientific basis. And for 25 years, they have been experimenting in the cross-breeding of animals. The results of these experiments with monkeys, baboons, gorillas, and apes 
have been so successful in creating not only better breeds of animals, but in aiding mankind in the medical field, that the government has seen fit to appropriate even more money for their continuation. Women workers find a welcome in a neighboring convent during their rest hours. Here in the almost subtropical climate and the abundant sunshine, the most fragrant of all tobacco growers. This is Turkish tobacco. The leaves are smaller than our American tobacco, and each leaf is hand-picked and then cured in the open sun. Over 90% of all tobaccos grown here are imported for use by American manufacturers. All around the Black Sea, agriculture flourishes, and all kinds of methods are used, some as old as they are. Goat raising on the slopes is one of their chief occupations. Grazing is plentiful, and the, they're valuable for their milk, and their hides, and their meat. On this trip along the coast of the Black Sea, we were very fortunate. We are soon to come upon a scene that could happen only once in a lifetime. The Ajarian women of the Batum section are largely of Turkish descent and of the Mohammedan faith. And they have lived for centuries, cramped by old family traditions. While many have torn themselves loose, largely through the efforts of the Ajarian Women's Club, whose activities have been ceaseless, today we are to pass a celebration of the unveiling of many more women. A celebration to further the emancipation of heavily veiled but beautiful Ajarian girls. On our arrival, we find a great gathering thrillingly addressed by the Commissaire of the People's Council. Other leaders tell these girls that their custom is ancient, that it was conceived when man's fund of knowledge was limited. Now is the time to uncover the face, to lift those black heavy veils, to enjoy all the new culture and education that is the right of every citizen. Look at those beautiful faces. Here are the women of the East unveiled for years in darkness, now in light, out of ignorance and superstition and into the new spirit of freedom. After the unveiling, we lingered to watch the joyous festivities. This was a great day, a glorious day, feasting, singing and dancing. Although we have had a very full day, we still must visit Batu. For there we are to take boat across the Black Sea to the Crimean resorts. Batu is one of the greatest seaports of the Near East, and it is the cultural center of the Adja Republic. The city life has a European aspect, with its sidewalk cafes and its crowded business street and its busy stalls. From a modern hotel on the beach, we watch the activity. Swimming is a much-loved sport of all these people. For Russians know the value of fresh air and sunshine. And here, as on the shores of the Volga, we find that they are a natural people. 
They are not here to show off a brand new colorful bathing suit that they don't even get wet. No, sir, but to benefit through the exercise and to enjoy to the full all the advantages that are theirs at vacation time. From this beach, as we look back toward the Caucasus, we can see an endless panorama. The sun, the sea, the exuberant plant life, and the mountains make an ever-changing, but an ever-beautiful picture resembling a vast natural garden. It is with memories of the eternal snow-capped mountains, the rolling plains, and the sheltered seashore that we leave the Adjar and board a coastwide steamer that is to bring us to our next Russian port, a Black Sea paradise, the Crimea. forms the southwest corner of Russia. Through it flows the fourth largest river in Europe, the Dnieper. This river holds one of the greatest engineering accomplishments in the world. On our way to the famous Lenin Dam, we pass quaint Ukrainian villages. In the Ukraine, we find a healthy, robust type of people. They are happy and active. They are great lovers of music and the dance. And at the least provocation, you will find groups that are gathering to sing to the accompaniment of their native bailarakas and to dance to the rhythms of their own folk songs. Through the Ukraine, we find lovely landscapes, and there is a poetic quality to their villages. Neat little thatched huts are kept clean with whitewashed walls and gardens of sweet-smelling flowers. There is something about the people here that resembles the smooth-flowing river on its way to the sea, quiet and peaceful, but determined. Ten years ago, dangerous rapids blocked the central portion of the Dnieper. With unceasing force, the waters plunge down over the jagged rocks, between the forests on one side and the hills on the other. The famous writer Gogol described its beauties almost a century ago. But these same rapids paralyzed shipping for over a distance of 100 miles. They actually divided the river into two separate halves. Here, one of the great dreams, first of Catherine the Great and later of Lenin, has come true. They dreamed of locking the foaming river with a gigantic wall of cement and steel, raising the water level to cover the rapids and harnessing the great water pressure thus created to spin huge dynamos that would give electric light and power to the whole countryside. Alexandrov, one of Russia's greatest engineers, was summoned, and he worked out the plans for the vast project. American engineers were brought to Russia and they, in turn, brought American machinery and American methods. Great masses of rock were blown from the mountainsides. Thousands of tons of sand were sucked up to buy dredges from the river bottom. Railroads were built to transport all of this directly to the site of the dam. 
tens of thousands of Russians worked and swarmed like ants. And slowly but surely, the dam began to take form. must eat. Here again, American methods came into play. Spacious mess halls were constructed. In the kitchens, the most modern American equipment enabled them to feed 10,000 workers at a time. Now those who scoffed at this audacious dream not only enjoy electric lights instead of tapers, but they see riverboats flying from the Black Sea the full length of the river. For in addition to the dam, locks raise and lower the ships with their rich cargoes of oil, fruits, and grain in three great steps from one level to the other. Now on the left bank of the river has been formed a great industrial combine utilizing the power created by the dam. At Donnay's Basin, we find the headquarters of the American engineers. At this point, there are vast deposits of coal and iron, rock salt, and manganese. These men give not only their advice, but their vast store of knowledge gained through experience and their time. For years, they worked shoulder to shoulder with the Russians to develop these natural resources. Here in the very heart of Russia, we find a truly American colony. The homes are built by Americans. They have their own schools and churches and apartment houses. children play American games, and because of the many years spent here, life takes on the aspect of an average American community. Healthy, robust children. And jovial fathers. But we leave again. Now we are leaving for Kharkov, situated on the northern border of the Ukraine. The Ukraine itself is the most densely populated state in Russia, one-fifth of its entire population being within these borders. And Kharkov is the largest city. It is a metropolis not only of the Ukraine, but of Russia. Students are sent from the most distant parts of Russia to take advantage of the educational facilities that are here in the University of Kharkov. There is a vast difference in the city of today and the Kharkov that was founded early in the 17th century. Today, the buildings are constructed to give the dwellers and workers all the benefits of sunshine and fresh air. Great power developments have necessitated the building of new industries. For example, in this huge electrical factory, the largest in all Russia, thousands of motors, coils, and other much needed electrical equipment is being constructed and turned out by skilled workers taught by American engineers. In walking through the streets of Kharkov, there is a constant fever of construction. New buildings are going up, new roads are being paved, new pipelines being laid. Everywhere, they seem to be trying to make up for lost time. Its great university, its huge factories and its museums, and libraries make Kharkov one of the cultural centers of Russia. Its many railway lines connecting it with a great part of the nation are arteries that enable you here to feel the pulse of new Russia. Through here pass the spices from the south, the furs from the north, fruits, cotton, and wines. And here at the junction is
being built on soil that was unused before, the largest office building in all Europe. There are many evidences of great advancement in all parts.